back in 2023, we saw the first ever claim that JWST had discovered a possible signature of life in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, so a planet orbiting another star in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Now, the media and the internet went absolutely wild for this. Whereas the astrophysics community took one look at that claim and went, Really? The claim was published in this paper by Medusa Dan and collaborators who studied the atmosphere of the exoplanet K218b with JWST and claimed that when they modelled the light that had passed through the planet's atmosphere, they needed both methane and something known as dimethyl sulfide there in the atmosphere to absorb certain colours of light to explain why they were missing in their data. Now, dimethyl sulfide on Earth is only produced by bacteria life. There's no way of making it, say, like through some chemistry in the atmosphere that we know of anyway. So it's always been one of those molecules that people have been on the lookout for in the atmospheres of exoplanets as a possible marker that life might exist there. Although it's worth saying again, there could be some unknown chemistry that could account for any dimethyl sulfide that you find in an exoplanet's atmosphere. It doesn't necessarily immediately point towards life. And what's more is that the evidence for this claim that dimethyl sulfide exists in K218b's atmosphere was weak at best, right? The statistics didn't really support it. And so a lot of other researchers within the exoplanet community in astrophysics were pretty doubtful of this result when it came out. There are even people saying that maybe the models have been a little bit cherry-picked as well to give this very weak evidence of dimethyl sulfide. Now, in the past few months of 2024, we've had two new papers that have also analysed the same JWST data of K218b. K218b, which both claim that there are other models that can explain K218b just as well with the same level of statistical backing. So what is going on here? Well, this kind of confusion of not knowing what the actual right answer is, is science in action and it is wonderful to see. So let's dive into all of these results so that you can make up your own mind. So in this video, we're going to start with the arguments from Medusa, Dan and collaborators that K218b is what's known as a Hysian planet with a liquid water ocean surface and an atmosphere containing dimethyl sulfide. Then the argument from Shortland collaborators for K218b having a magma ocean. And then third, the argument from Wogan and collaborators that K218b is a mini Neptune gas planet with no surface whatsoever. And then finally, what new data we're going to need to figure this all out. But before we dive into that, let's just start with a recap of what we do know about K218b. So it's an exoplanet orbiting a star around about 124 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Leo. And it was discovered in 2015 by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope during its K2 mission, hence the name. And it orbits a red dwarf star, which is called K218. It's much smaller and cooler than our sun. And K218b takes just 33 days to make one orbit of its star. So it orbits much closer in than the Earth does around the sun. But because its star is cooler, it still sits in what's known as the habitable zone around its star, which means that you're getting the right amount of light from a star so that any planet would be not too hot or not too cold for life to potentially exist there. Now, in 2019, K218b made headlines for the first time when Beneke and collaborators reported that they found evidence for water vapour in its atmosphere, which was a huge deal at the time. Like, yeah, we'd found water vapour in the atmospheres of exoplanets before, but we'd never done it in a habitable zone exoplanet. So that raised a lot of speculation about whether K218b could host life. That's despite the fact that Coulter and collaborators had already worked out the mass of K218b as 8.63 times heavier than Earth, putting it about halfway between Earth and Neptune. So even before JWST, there was a lot of people asking these questions about what K218b was like. Was it a very dense super Earth with a rocky surface, maybe even with a liquid water ocean on it? Or was it a mini Neptune with no surface at all and just gas all the way down? Which is why two separate groups applied to use JWST to observe the atmosphere of K218b to figure out what this planet is actually like. Now, to do this with JWST, what you do is you wait until the planet passes in front of its star from our perspective here on Earth so that a bit of starlight passes through the planet's atmosphere. You can then take that light and split it into what's known as a spectrum where you get a trace of how much light at each colour or wavelength of light you have. 
if there are certain molecules in the atmosphere of that planet, they'll absorb specific wavelengths that are unique to those molecules, and then you can identify them as gaps in the spectrum of the light to know that they're there. So one of those observing proposals that wanted to do just this with K218b was led by Medusadan at Cambridge. And it was with that data that they published this paper claiming that K218b was what's known as a Haitian world and had this dimethyl sulfide in its atmosphere, this potential marker of life. Now I've already covered this paper in a video on my channel when it first came out, which I'll link below if you're interested because I go into way more detail there. But to summarize quickly, what Medusa and collaborators did was get that data from JWST from two instruments on board, NIRIS and NIRSPEC, and then fit models of the atmosphere to that data containing different amounts of molecules, things like carbon dioxide and water vapor and methane and see what was the best fit model that they got. So in this plot, you've got wavelength on the x-axis or the color of the light and then how much of that wavelength was absorbed by the exoplanet's atmosphere on the y-axis. So if there's any bumps upward on this plot, what that means is there's more of that wavelength of light missing, which means there's more of the thing that's doing the absorbing in the the exoplanet's atmosphere. Now the data from JWST is shown by the orange and the red points. So orange is from the nearest instrument at shorter infrared wavelengths and red is from the near spec instrument at longer infrared wavelengths. In blue is their best fit model and that's at a much higher like wavelength resolution. You can see it moves around a lot much more than the data points. So what they did was they also binned that model to the same resolution as the data which is what the yellow circles then show. So for a perfect model, the yellow circles would all line up with the orange and red points at each wavelength, which they don't because this isn't a perfect model, it's just the best fit model that they could get. Now in that best fit model, they then get concentrations of all of the different molecules that they included, which is what's shown here for methane, carbon dioxide, dimethyl sulfide, water, ammonia, hydrogen cyanide, and methyl chloride in each of these panels in the blue histograms. So the histogram shows how likely a model is when each molecule is at the concentration that's given on the x-axis. So essentially where this blue histogram peaks is the most likely concentration value. These are log scales, but if you translate that into normal numbers, what you've got is a 0.9% concentration of methane, 1.7% concentration of carbon dioxide, 0.003% of dimethyl sulfide, and then just tiny trace amounts of the other molecules that are shown on the bottom row. And then the rest of the atmosphere is just hydrogen. Now each of these concentrations that they get from the model has like a statistical support to it, what we call a significance that tells us how well the data supports this claim. That's what these values are in brackets here in this table. So a value of 4.7 sigma, that's what that symbol is there for the methane concentrations, means there's a one in two million chance that the methane concentrations they found in their model is just due to a statistical fluke, maybe perhaps due to like noise easy data. Whereas a value of only 2.4 sigma for the dimethyl sulfide means there's just a 1 in 66 chance that what they found is a statistical fluke. It's very weak evidence for dimethyl sulfide, this possible marker of life. And the reason that it's so weak is because the wavelengths that dimethyl sulfide absorbs the most light at, which is shown in the purple line there, also coincides with where methane absorbs a lot of light, which is shown by the green line. So you could mistake one for the other, which is why the evidence isn't that strong. But putting that aside, Medusa and collaborators say that the mix of molecules that they find in their best fit model supports the idea that K218b is what's known as a Haitian world. It's a portmanteau of hydrogen and ocean. So it's a liquid water ocean surface surrounded by a thick hydrogen atmosphere. And specifically, it's the lack of ammonia, NH3, that they find in their model is what they argue supports this Haitian world hypothesis the strongest. But that's not what Shortle and collaborators find. 
Here's that exact same data that Medusa Dan showed. This time they're plotting the JWST data in grey points and then their best fit model is shown by the black line. With all their other models that fit the data to within a three sigma significance, so less than a one in 300 chance of being a statistical fluke, shown in the blue lines. So these models are more statistically significant than Medusa Dan's claim of dimethyl sulfide. So what are they? Well, they model K218b as once again having a very thick hydrogen dominated atmosphere, but instead of being over a liquid water ocean, they model it as a magma ocean. Magma as in lava, liquid rock. The magma accounts for the high concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane, but also the lack of ammonia, NH3, because nitrogen dissolves into magma, which is why it doesn't react with the hydrogen in the atmosphere to form ammonia. Now, Shortland collaborators do point out how hard it is to truly distinguish between these two scenarios, but they argue that the magma ocean is more likely than the water ocean for K218b, because when K218b first formed, when its star was much younger, the star also would have been hotter, meaning that for K218b even to have evolved with a liquid water ocean on its surface would be very unlikely. But the big question is whether K218b even has a surface at all, because Wogan and collaborators argue that K218b could just be a gas-rich mini Neptune. Again, here's that same spectral data from JWST that Medusa Dan showed, with the nearest data in dark grey and near spec in a light grey in each of these three panels. Then they fit three different models to this data. First in the top panel, a Haitian world with no life in it. Then second in the bottom left panel, a Haitian world with microbial life in it. Those two are different because life does have an impact on the atmosphere of a planet, changing like the ratio of different molecules that form and sometimes even the chemistry of what's going on. And then the third model that they fit in the bottom right there is a mini Neptune with no surface, just a thick gas atmosphere. And they determined how good of a fit each of these models was by looking at this value known as chi squared. Essentially, the lower the value of chi squared, the better fit your model is. So model one of a lifeless Haitian is ruled out because the chi squared is more than double the other two. But model two and model three have the same chi squared value, meaning they're both equally as likely. The data from JWST is fit equally best by either a Haitian world with life or a mini Neptune gas planet. Now, Wogan and collaborators argue that given how volatile red dwarf stars are, which give off these huge flares of energy that can disrupt planets close to them, it's not likely that K218b would be able to support a stable climate or even stable atmosphere that would be able to support life because as energy is given off by the star, you can also strip off the atmosphere of the planet. So Wogan and collaborators favor the mini Neptune interpretation because it doesn't need anything else to be just right or just just so, it's the simplest way to explain the JWST data. So hopefully now you can tell why this is such a headache for the exoplanet community, especially with this ever constant media interest in this planet that doesn't seem to be going away, despite the fact that we've had these two new results that have offered equally likely interpretations of this data. So that brings me to how are we eventually going to be able to figure this out? Well, more JWST data is gonna help here, specifically from the MIRI instrument on board JWST that goes to much longer wavelengths than NearSpec. So NearSpec goes out to about five microns, but MIRI starts at about four microns and detects wavelengths much longer than that, which is key, first of all, for dimethyl sulfide, which absorbs light at about seven and 10 microns, crucially without the interference of methane, so we can tell the two apart. Then secondly, there's more absorption from both carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide at those longer wavelengths, again, that separate out so we can tell them apart, so we can work out the ratio between CO2 and CO, which is important for distinguishing between that magma ocean or liquid water ocean scenario, because a magma ocean planet will have a much lower CO2 to CO ratio than a hydrogen planet with a liquid water ocean. So this extra MIRI data will hopefully be the key to figuring all of this out. And luckily for us, that data has now been taken at the end of April this year, although it's not yet 
public. It's Medusa Dan and collaborators that have applied for that data, so they will be able to look at it first and analyze it, which means the first we'll hear about this MIRI data is Medusa Dan and collaborators' interpretation of it. But as we saw with the previous JWST data of K218B, it might not be that clear cut. And their interpretation might not be the same that other research groups have and eventually publish. So if you see this planet hit the headlines again in the next few months, promise me you'll bear all of this in mind. And remember that just because one model fits the data doesn't mean there aren't other models that fit the data equally as well. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and continuing to support me and this channel. Brilliant is a learning platform that's designed to be uniquely effective, right? They've got thousands of interactive lessons in science, maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. Their first principles approach to each new topic helps you build understanding from the ground up. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that like lets you play around with a concept, a method that's been shown to be six times more effective than passively watching lecture videos. Now, a lot of what underpins astrophysics research these days is data analysis and fitting models to data. And Brilliant has recently launched a ton of new data analysis lessons, all of which use real world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions. If you're a complete beginner or you're continuing to learn more about data analysis, it doesn't matter. They have this whole suite of new content from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regression. So to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description below. If you do, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription with Brilliant. So thank you so much to Brilliant again for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. That's K218B Espresso. And it was with that data that they published this paper on K28B. K28B? Um, yeah, <laughs> a stable atmosphere, and they for and they for and they are for. <laughs> Too bad your model don't do it for you.